good afternoon one and all um, um, firstly i welcome uh, all of you for today's talk which is the second talk under development discourse uh, being organized by uh, or combined organized by center for policy studies and department of energy science and engineering i would like to uh, invite uh, today's uh, speaker uh, dr ajay mathur director general uh, terry on the dais I would also like to invite uh, Professor Agnihotri, Head of Center for Policy Studies, on the desk. Uh, may I request Swaran to uh, welcome them with class? Yeah. I also I invite uh, today's discussants, Professor Randan Bharatji, current Head of uh, Department of Energy Science, and uh, Professor K. Narayan, on the desk. I began to uh, welcome them in the class. Friends, uh, <clears throat> welcome to this uh, talk under development discourse. As I mentioned, the Center for Policy Studies has uh, taken a stand at every week, uh, so every month we will be organizing uh, a talk on certain topic which has policy relevance and this will be organized uh, together with different uh, departments and centers. If you recollect last time we had a talk on CSR which was done together with the office of the Dean uh, uh, Cooperation, International Cooperation and uh, Corporate Relationship. This time the Department of uh, Energy Sciences and we decided to hold talk uh, and uh, we couldn't think of a better speaker uh, than uh, Dr. Ajay Mansur is DG Terry now but he was uh, head of Bureau of Energy Efficiency and there uh, I mean, we normally say that an ounce of uh, practice is much better than a ton of theory. I think in BE, he did probably a ton of practice, so you can work out the equivalence in terms of uh, the theory. And some of these things have a huge policy relevance, because one of the issues which uh, in policy discourse that we always come across is this very, very standard uh, Indian description here, where policies are fantastic, the implementation is a problem. And I uh, do recollect a meditated volume called Room for Maneuver. Uh, I think it is uh, Clay and Schaffer, probably, where they had, way, way back, I think, uh, late 80s, uh, they had come up with this whole idea that the moment you say this, that your policy is brilliant, but implementation is problem, there's something wrong in the design of your policy itself. The second point why I want to uh, emphasize uh, about the steps taken by the E is that government has a huge choice or, or has a tough choice in between the subsidy route and uh, alternate route. I'll mean, I'll not spell out about that alternate route. It could be A, B, C, D, various uh, options. Subsidy, which initially starts at a, as a ladder, ultimately becomes a crutch. That's a, that has been experience of many people. And um, Ajay and his colleagues showed us a very uh, decent way by reducing the cost itself to the consumer through sustained volume. And I, I think that's a much uh, better way uh, compared to perpetuating subsidy at infinity. So these are the two reasons. I had a, by the time I think I um, joined here and uh, Ajay joined Delhi, I had a residual grouse left against him, uh, that uh, he has brought in star rating for various appliances, but I've been chasing him for inverter uh, star rating, and I, uh, till uh, this afternoon, I nursed a feeling that was name why, and I think he, he clarified his yes, that has also been initiated. Uh, 
Ajay has been a DG of uh, me for, since 2006 to 2016. So yeah, he, he did realize, I think, that he has no one else to blame. My predecessor has done this because people will say 10 years there. But then I think if you see his scoreboard, you don't really have to worry about it. He will talk about it. He was earlier in Tehran, uh, from 86 to 2000. And he, the interesting thing is he, he has uh, you know, hands-on practice as well. Uh, he has headed the climate uh, change team of World Bank uh, for a while. He was also president of Suzlon Energy uh, Limited. He headed the interim secretariat of the Green Climate Fund. And more interestingly, he's been a key uh, climate change negotiator uh, on the Indian side. So if something goes wrong, we know whom to blame among <laughs> others. Uh, and today, uh, as a slightly in, uh, uh, unenviable task, because the two discussants which are banking him on both the sides are very familiar with his work. So I have to assure them that this is uh, PAT 2.0. And then almost they said, achha, achha, they think, uh, because, you know, so they will read it. So I think by the time Ajay's uh, talk is over and the discussions, uh, observations are over and his response uh, comes in, we'll know where the pat uh, belongs to, who's back or not. Pat's back. Yeah, and pat. With these remarks, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Ajay. Okay. Um, yes.
and on the basis of policy design, how do you bring things together? And then measure them against a holistic benchmark, not against analytic, not against benchmarks on specific analytics. Both of them are equally valid. Both of them perform different kinds of functions. But I would very much like that a strong uh, 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 set of analyses in both of these areas is initiated. So without further ado, as far as industrial energy policy is concerned, there has been for a very long time in this country a belief that Indian industry is inefficient. If I asked you, most people, I presume, will say that Indian industry is inefficient. Some will say, well, it's a mixed bag. Some are efficient, many are not. This broad agreement that there are pockets of inefficiency, at least, is the place where we started from. It's also one of the reasons why the Bureau of Energy Efficiency was founded. So what I will do today is walk you through this PAC experience. The PAC was created in response to the public perception that Indian industries are not efficient. And then spend some time on how implementation happened. And then look at policy issues, which the three that I look at are the importance of the legal basis, uh, which I must confess that for many people may not be a particularly important issue, but if you are working from government, it tends to become the most important issue. The issue of fairness, because I believe that in the long term, if people will continue to work, the stakeholders will continue to work with the policy, it is because it is perceived as being fair to all stakeholders. And lastly, the issue of sustainability. Is it a one-off policy or will it continue over time and continue to make a difference? So those are the three areas that I look at. Obviously, there are many more that can also be addressed. So as I said, the, there is a broad agreement that Indian energy efficiency, particularly in industry, needs to be made better. As a result, there, when the Energy Conservation Act was passed by Parliament in 2001, it included, and this is the lower part, which says, that the Government of India and the Bureau of Energy Efficiency can choose energy intensive industries and call them designated consumers and issue and notify what are known as energy consumption norms. You shall not consume more than so much. And that their energy performance can be assessed by independent energy audit. So this is what already was the provision of the law in 2001. As we tried to put it into practice, and we went into various energy intensive sectors, one of the things that we found was wherever we went, every sector, some of the most energy efficient plants in the world what did you get? Cement, fertilizer, paper, refineries, you name it. This, I must confess, took us completely by surprise. So we said, if the most efficient plants are here, then there's nothing to worry about. The problem then we saw, and it took us a very long time to understand this problem, was that while the most efficient plants, this is the amount of 
specific energy consumption. So the more to the left you are, the more efficient you are. The most efficient plants in the world are here. You also have plants who use twice as much energy. In the case of pulp and paper, you have guys who use nearly three times as much energy. Jump right to the last. Uh, this became a problem. How do we address a situation in which you have got a bandwidth problem? Nobody in the world has addressed a bandwidth problem. In fact, a very respected colleague, in fact, I would say one of the finest analytical minds in the country, in the energy area, who was at that time at the Planning Commission, said, this can't happen. I said, this is the data. He said, this can't happen. How the ones who are least efficient would be out of the market. Yes, this is what economic theory teaches us. That you really can't have these people surviving when these people are around. And as a, you know, to go to, uh, like you, all of you, I am an engineer, I believe in empirical data. And I said, this is the situation before us. But it took us on a tangent because we had to explain why this was the case. And the reason is rather interesting. In a country like India or in any developing country, demand, for example, whether it is for cement or whether it is for paper is growing. You set up a plant today, it is meeting people's needs. But the demand increases tomorrow and the day after. So I decide I'm going to set up another plant which will meet that increased demand. Now when I set it up, it costs more. But I have to compete in the same market as this fellow. How do I do it? The only way I can do it is by being more energy efficient. So while my capital costs are more, my variable costs are less. As a result, for purely for competitive reasons, plants that are set up later have to be more efficient than the plants that were set up earlier. And what that results in is the bandwidth problem that we see. I'm not very sure whether my friend was completely convinced with this answer. Uh, doesn't seem he was. But the more we look, the more we talk to people who are doing investments now, we understand that this is a concern. How am, how am I going to be competitive against plants which have existed for 20 years and are in a sense fully depreciated? Now, all industrial energy efficiency enhancement policy had occurred in developed countries. And the model was that you set up You set up a target somewhere here and say everybody has to reach this target. If these guys try to come here, they would have to close. There's no way they can become that efficient. And therefore, it became a bit of a challenge that, or if you set the line here, that's meaningless because everybody's above it. So setting one line where everybody has to move to was either you're closing down the industry or it's meaningless. This obviously was socialized within the government. And in 2008, when in response to the upcoming Bali uh, conference of the parties to the Climate Change Convention, the government of India announced the National Action Plan on Climate Change. It included eight missions. One of the missions was the National Mission on Enhanced Energy Efficiency. And it had four components. But the government said that it would put into place a market-based mechanism, market-based mechanism, to enhance cost effectiveness of improvements in energy efficiency in energy intensive large industries and facilities. There's a second point I'd like to remember. First is market-based mechanism. Second is energy intensive large industries. And the third is through certification of energy savings. 
certification of energy savings that could be created. So now we had to do this and these were the tools that we had. This was the reality with which we were living. So the draft that was prepared for the PAC said, one, everybody had to become more efficient. Even the guy who is the most efficient in the world has to become more efficient. Even this fellow has to become more efficient. And that what we will try to do is therefore to reduce the bandwidth. This was quite a challenge because again as I said the developed country experience was everybody moves to the best. And therefore in the first year the entire discussion was about why are we using a new policy tool, why don't we use the policy tool which is which has been worked, which has been done in many countries and works in many countries. And therefore we have to point out the fact that listen, the bandwidth doesn't exist in other countries. I mean this had to be explained at the level of the Prime Minister and the Council on Climate Change. That we are looking at a different policy problem. And it's a different policy problem which calls for a different answer. So what was the answer? The answer was, we will set a different target for each plant. The ones who are already efficient, these guys, their target is very small. They have to move slightly to the left. Those who are inefficient, their target is more. They have to shift much more to the left. So now people said, oh my god, you're talking of plant specific targets. This is going to be a mess. So that was the second point. Now, the third thing, remember, it said that market mechanism and trading. So what they said was, say you are here. This is how much energy, specific energy consumption. This is the amount of energy that you use to produce a ton of cement or steel. And your target is set here. You could meet it, that would be lovely. You could actually exceed it. In which case we will issue you certificates, energy saving certificates, e -service, for the excess savings, that means the savings beyond the target. On the other hand, it is quite possible that you were not able, you were here, you came here. This is what you would achieve, although you had to come here. So you bought some of these savings, these certificates, they could be used for compliance. If you were not still able to meet your target, then there will be a penalty. And this was a financial penalty which is equal in cost to the cost of this energy. So first you bought this energy, then you pay a fine which is equal to this energy. So this was the basis of the program as we went forward. Targets for each plant. The most efficient plants having smaller targets. The less efficient plants having larger targets. And the uh, uh, those who overachieve get certificates for their excess savings. They could be used, they could be banked by them for the next cycle, or they could be sold by others who use them for compliance. If you are not able to meet your target, you pay a penalty for what you are not able to achieve. Because remember, as far as the country is concerned, we save the total amount of energy whether he does it or he does not. It is done in a cost-effective manner. It is done by the person who finds cheapest to reduce their energy consumption. Remember, cost-effectiveness was one of the things that was there in the... Uh, uh, to enhance cost-effectiveness of improvements. Now, the challenge was, how do you set up these targets? So the way it was done was that we 
first said that there will be a 5% reduction in the uh, specific energy consumption in each sector. Why 5%? No great thinking or no great analysis behind it. The Bureau runs a program for awards for industries who are able to achieve a lot of energy efficiency. And if you look at the people who are the best, what we find is that on an year-to-year -year basis, the kind of savings that they get is about a 2% reduction in their specific energy consumption, 2% a year. So over three years, it becomes 6%. So we said that the best performers are at 6%. On the other end, if you look at the average, the average is about 1.4% per year. Obviously, there's a distribution. Uh, some are more, some are less, but the average was about 1.4%. That adds up to 4.2% uh, a year. Arbitrarily, we chose a number between 4.2 and 6 at 5% a year. There was no great math about it. However, as you will see later, this did have major ramifications. But when we did it, we said we have no basis to start with what is possible. So we chose a number of 5%. Now, 5% is what the sector as a whole has to achieve. The ones who are the most effort, energy, this is the amount of energy that you need for a ton of product and you have guys all the way from about 525 all the way to 950. This is actually for the pulp and paper sector. And even in pulp and paper sector, we broke it into three subdivisions. This is one of the subdivisions. Now, we said the person Supposing this fellow, the reduction he has to do is X. He's at 525. There's somebody else at 575. 575 divided by 525 is about 1.1. So his target will be 1.1 X. X is the smallest. So you find it for all of them and add it up. That should equal 5%. So you find the value of X. Because one of the things that the Prime Minister himself told us was there should be a clear and transparent way of how the targets are set. It should not depend on which side of the bed you get out of. I'll talk about this in greater detail. This was discussed at great length with industry. In fact, it's industry who said that you must have a differentiated target, not a, not one target, not 5% for the entire industry. Anyway, the point is, here is the data, here is the methodology, you can run it, you find what your own target is. So, it was launched in March 2012, and it was launched by means of two notifications. One was the rules of the game and the second was the individual target. I don't think it's visible but this is the name of the industry. This is what their production was, what their baseline uh, uh, specific energy consumption was. So each industry, these accredited auditors went there and measured what was the amount of energy that they were using and what their target is. So this is part of a government notification. So this is in the public domain. Everybody knows this. There was this whole issue of how will you measure this. So we said we will use the easiest method because you have to verify it. What is the total amount of energy that is bought? How much coal do you buy? How much oil do you buy? How much electricity do you buy? And how much material do you sell? How much sales tax do you pay? So in a sense, these are both verifiable because I can go to the coal company, I can go to the oil company, I can go to the electricity company, find out how much was sold to these people. 
I can go to the sales tax department and find out what is the amount of material on which they pay sales tax. You take the two, to divide one by the other, you get this gate, what we call the gate to gate specific energy consumption. This is not really the energy efficiency as it is defined in many industries. But remember, and we'll come to this in a moment, we needed to make sure that this was verifiable. Because verifiability is very important, which is technically a better index. Now, we also developed how, you know, how the ESERs would be issued, how they would be numbered, so that each ESERT has a very specific number, and then how would they be traded. The PXs are the power exchanges, so they would be exchanged, they would be traded on the power exchanges. The Central Electricity Regulatory Commission would be the regulator of this trading. PEE would provide the platform, the, the uh, IT platform on which which company has how many uh, ESERs is recorded. They provide this to a register. The designated consumer, he is the owner of the ESERs or the buyer of the ESERs, they then do this purchase and the registry then changes accordingly. So an IT platform around this has been developed. Now, to come to the last, what has been very unfortunate is that the ESERTs have not been issued, the trading has not started. So I'm not going to spend very much more time on the mechanics of how this works. Now, essentially implementation started from the 1st of April 2012. The first phase was the 1st of April 2012 to the 31st of March 2015, three-year period. So in the year 1415, the plant had to show that they were able to achieve the target specific energy consumption. Now, one of the things that started immediately was that, uh, you know, one of the other things that we had brought out was a book, which came out in July, which explained how this is to be done. This was discussed in great detail. In every state, at least once a year, there was a meeting of all the uh, designated consumers. They also met separately in sectoral meetings. So the steel people meeting together, the textile people meeting together, and so on. There was also a set of books brought out by CII, by CSTEP, by Terry, on the kind of technology options that were available to these uh, designated consumers about what could be done. Now, one of the things that the uh, what that the industry said was that in 2014-15, the situation may not be the same as in 11-12, the base year for which the data had been collected. What could be? So we said, first of all, it has to be things are different which are outside the control of the plant. What could those be? The first that was thrown at us was, what if the electricity that is available through the grid is less in 1415 than it is in 1112? That means that I will have to generate my own electricity. I will have to buy coal. Coal has a much higher calorific value than electricity. Electricity is 860 kilocalories. Coal is 3,500 to 4,500 kilocalories. The efficiency of conversion, therefore, is adding as an energy to the power. So we said, okay. We set up technical committees and essentially said that for the reasons that your capacity utilization becomes much less or much more, this will impact your uh, 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 specific energy consumption. 
It is very interesting that one of the places where this became very important, if you didn't think in the baseline year, is the electricity sector. In this year, the average plant load factor of thermal power stations in 11-12 was nearly 70%. And it was less than 60% in the year 14. Massive reduction in the amount, of, uh, in terms of the power plant, a massive reduction in this capacity load factor and a massive increase in this specific energy. Similarly, product mix and intermediary products. In the steel industry, for example, the, sorry, in the cement industry, there is now a much greater demand for OPC, ordinary portrait cement, than there was earlier. This meant that the grinding energy increased. Therefore, we made a list of the kinds of things which are beyond the control of the plant management, which could affect the specific energy. And for each of the sectors, a technical committee received requests, not on their own, but received requests from the designated consumer that this is what is happening and establish a normalization rule. So for each sector, you have a book which tells you what the normalization rules are. So the technical committee became another way in which there was a constant interaction between the pack design on the one hand and the problems that industry was facing in implementing pack on the other hand. So what did this all end up as? When we ended the 31st of March 2015, and then again sent out the auditors to find out how much energy was used, these are the savings. Now, this number we had set at 6.6. .6. What we achieved was 8.6. And this is after normalization. If you do it before normalization, it's even a larger number. And note, this is 427. We had started with 478. In these three years, 51 industries dropped dead. Either they stopped production. Well, actually, all of them stopped production, essentially. There was one case in which a plant was taken over by a neighbor. So typically, even if the same company owns two plants in different places, we would count them as two plants. But in this particular case, they were contiguous to each other and they formed a common plant. But that was only one case. In all the other cases, essentially, plants closed down. So 6.6 was the goal. What we achieved was 8.67. This obviously is a huge question that we need to ask. Was 6.6 .6 too low? Or is 8.67 too high? Did industry overachieve? Or was the target set too low? This is one of the questions I leave with you. Now, as this cycle ended, and as all the analyses occurred during 1516, the second cycle was announced on the 31st of March 2016, again for a three year period up to the year 1819. This time, there are the eight sectors which were there earlier, and there are three more sectors refineries, electricity distribution companies, and railways. The overall goal this time around is 8.869, so much higher than 6.6, .6, but not very different from the 8.6 that had been achieved. But the, if you just go to the last one, where is it that we saw the largest increase? We saw it in cement, and we saw it in fertilizer, and we saw it in iron mix. And thermal, well, thermal power stations, the numbers are very, very large. But one of the issues also was, in this case, have we taken away all the low-hanging fruit? So now it becomes a lot more difficult. So we, 
now it became a more difficult issue to set the, uh, the uh, goals because you got the old plants 427 of those you also have the newer plants in these same sectors and in these same sectors we said they have to be as good as the best and you have the new sectors and the new plants in those new sectors so there are now three kinds of plants and three kinds of methodologies anyway this is what was announced again there, during this one year there was a huge amount of interaction on what needed to change as far as the process was concerned so that the transaction costs are minimized and therefore one of the things that was done was that the rules were amended this is largely to reduce transaction costs and new targets were set in a new notification that was issued. So this is where we are today. Let me now spend a few minutes on the major policy issues that, it, that we address in the process of going ahead. All of these I've already talked about. I'll focus on them a little bit. Now, as far as the legal framework is concerned, Anything that the government does has to have, it should be empowered to do so, and it should be empowered by parliament to do so. As I said, the Energy Conservation Act already empowered us that the energy intensive industries, we could set energy consumption norms for them. That was good. But as far as trading is concerned, that wasn't there. So there was this whole process of developing an amendment to the Energy Conservation Act which allowed for the concept of energy saving certificate and allowed for the concept of trading. There was a lot of give and take between various ministries, the Ministry of Law, then it went up to the cabinet, the cabinet approved it, then it went for parliament, it went for Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, but by August 2010, it had been approved. Any great pros and cons in this process? only one. We had wanted that the selling and buying of or buying of e and later selling should be open to anybody. That means if you want to buy an e you should be free to do so. But given the rigidities of the Indian legal system, particularly because this kind of free uh, 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 trading is in the Indian context seen as speculation and speculation is governed by a body called the Agricultural Forward Markets Commission. So what would that would have meant was that the trading would then be regulated by the Agricultural Forward Markets Commission and not by the CERC. We wanted to keep it in the same. So we agreed that the buyers and sellers would be only designated consumers rather than open it up. So this was one trade-off that was consciously done in the process of the amendment being moved. Fairness was a key issue because Professor Neotrin talked of the fact that Ultimately, if a pro program is not, a policy is not being implemented, then there's probably something wrong with the design of the policy. Our view at that point of time, and I think it's still true today, is that many such regulatory policies get embroiled in courts. And if they get embroiled in courts, they don't go ahead. If they get embroiled in courts, it means you didn't do your job well, you didn't design it. We wanted, therefore, to be very sure that to start with, nobody had a problem with this. And therefore, consultation was very, very important to us. The first draft that was prepared was discussed across the country. Any number of meetings, sectoral meetings, state meetings, we got all the inputs, tables were prepared, you will remember the standard government way of doing it, half, half column uh, things. On one side you write what was the comment, on the other side what are you doing with that comment. 
Many a times, the response was, we are throwing this out. But two key things emerged. One was this issue that the guys who were newer said they've invested much more in energy efficiency. We can't have the same targets. We can't do 5%. So this issue of differentiated targets, smaller targets for the more efficient, larger targets for the less efficient, evolved out of those constructs. The second was the whole issue of normalization. That the conditions in the target year may not be the same as the conditions in the base year. And therefore you needed methodologies in order to compare apples and apples. These two key features were then integrated into the design document, which again went through a round of meetings. My colleagues who manage these meetings tell me that there were a total of 96 consultations that we had both in the first phase and the second phase. More than anything else, our goal was that the industry takes ownership of this process. It has been successful. We had no legal challenges for three years. But in the month of March 2015, the last month of the pact, three companies <coughs> One in Tamil Nadu, one in Chhattisgarh, and two in Chhattisgarh filed uh, uh, cases in the High Court saying that, for example, that they have not been consulted. For example, that this is arbitrary and unfair. Two of those have already been thrown out. The third also, I presume, will be thrown out because it's on very similar grounds. But the timing of it suggests to us, and this is the case we also made in the, in, the, in the replies that we filed, that for three years they were silent. Here are the papers that these guys attended the seminars. This is the papers that they were physically, that they, a physical letter was sent to them to tell them that this process is going on, to tell them the target that was given to them. It took them three years to respond. This clearly is, they are positioning themselves if they come out as being in negative when the, uh, when the truing up is done. And as I said, two of those have been dismissed, the third will probably be dismissed. So, in a sense, it has been successful because the vast number of people have agreed with it. We also carried out, as I said, we said that there would be these accredited auditors who would go and do checks. We also said, in a sample of plants selected at random, another auditor will go and check the work of the earlier auditor, 10% of the cases. The reason was, this is a classic case for collusion between the designated consumer and the auditor. And the only way that you can check it is by having check on. I don't even know whether, I mean, obviously in the check audits you never go to 100%, so you don't know. There's obviously a possibility of a collusion between the check auditor and the company, but it is that much minimized. We also went through the process in this, as you were doing this, of blacklisting, taking off the roles one accredited auditor, just to make sure, I mean, it was sort of it. It was just to make sure that it could be done, this is something that you can suffer. And the person, even today, comes to the minister and asks to be deemed. So, in other words, it affected him badly enough. Sustainability. <clears throat> As I said, the savings that we got were much more than the target. If I had to go back to 2011 or 2010 actually, would we set the targets differently? As I told you, we did not apply any great mathematics or analysis in setting the target. We said it's 5%. Should we have set it at 6, which is what has been achieved? A little more than 6. Remember, 
six is what the best companies were achieving at that time. Should we have pendant at that? Now, as of today, the second phase has been put into place. Uh, as far as sustainability is concerned, I would like to note that by the time the second, the Pact 2 was notified, I had already left the Bureau. But there was so much pressure, both from industry as well from the government, to make sure that the new targets were issued before the 31st of March 2006. To me, this is a measure of the sustainability that both the government and industry want that in order to reduce the uncertainty, to enhance predictability, targets are put into place as soon as possible. Undone. And as I said, one of my problems is that the insert issuance and trading have yet to start. So that leads me to a few lessons that I believe we have learned. Please remember this is work in progress. Writing, we are in the process of writing this up. The comments that you give would help us greatly in either carrying out new analysis to what, additional analysis to what we have done, or to fine tuning it. So in the so as preliminary lessons, what we would like to share is that one of the things we have learned in the policy process is that the huge amount of concentration beforehand helped in the acceptability of the program. The second is that the technical committees created a forum for constant interaction between the regulator, DEE, and the industry. And that, I think, helped also as a safety mark. But then there are also these issues, on the other hand, which is that the overachievement of the targets sets the credibility of the target setting exercise. And that the inability to issue research and initiate trading, I believe, can lead to stakeholder loss of confidence. Again, whether will it, it will or not, it's too early to say. But I do suggest that this is one of the weaknesses that we have seen in the system where public servants are not comfortable in signing off on the research. I'll end here. I thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to the discussion and to the questions. Thank you very much. And uh, as I earlier mentioned, this was, we are looking at PAT 2.0, <laughs> so uh, Ajay hasn't disappointed us. Uh, I think uh, we will have no observations from the two discussants, uh, and Professor Narayanan will go first. Just a quick comment on uh, your target setting and uh, the no great maths uh, or analysis being used. It always reminds me of uh, Professor Amartya Sen's uh, favorite quote. He uh, keeps saying that it is not his original, but he hasn't told me the source. It is better to be vaguely right than be precisely wrong. So I think if you have uh, more or less without great maths done this, you will have a nagging worry that uh, did you set the target slow. But I, I don't think in a new scheme the first five overs should be power play. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you could uh, leave that out. So. With these two observations, I think I will move to Professor Narayanan first and then Narayanan. Oh, do you want this one? Okay. You did as your class. No. No. Okay. This works. Okay. Good evening. Uh, First of all, I want to thank uh, Satish for giving me an opportunity to discuss a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, one uh, known Dr. Mathur for a long time, ever since we started meeting in Delhi 
for preparing India's national communication uh, to UNFCCC. Uh, and then it will always be wonderful hearing him uh, going through his presentation. He presented so lucidly that I must say that the presentation was excellent. I, mean, you know, uh, I was reading the paper and then in the presentation. I mean, he can make it as clear as possible for all politicians as well. So I have been in the audience along with them many, 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 many presentations. So some thoughts quickly uh, on what uh, the thing. So as I said, it's very uh, interesting and he uh, analyzes the impact of the impact policy that we uh, try to implement with respect to energy efficiency of India. And of course, he has also opened up several research questions. So students, I hope uh, all of you have known now, himself uh, mentioned some of them. And uh, so uh, that's what I would like to start with. So specifically, now we began with the bandwidth problem. And uh, he talked about the use of market-based instruments to deal with the bandwidth problem. And uh, what Pat specified, uh, or attempted to specify in the beginning was plant specific targets. But then, of course, the limitation was they tried to have 5% calling it one size fits all. Uh, and then they tried to introduce exim energy scripts exactly like what we had thought in 1980s called exim scripts which is well known uh, you know, in the common circle for those exporting companies to earn foreign exchange so that they could trade on those scripts for those who, the importers who need the foreign exchange beyond what the reserve bank permits them to uh, exchange in the rupees for. Uh, so that would have definitely come up, picked up very well, but unfortunately it is not yet uh, been put in place. But I think in my uh, assessment, which of course he also uh, raised it very uh, uh, succinctly, is the issue of transparency and certification. Because how, how I mean, he sort of subtly put it, but maybe uh, informally he could tell us, not in formal presentation, but informally, what kind of transfer was the transparency in certification a real issue again? So why was the industry not really, uh, you know, coming so much on board that we, in spite of uh, preparing the entire document with consultative process? So is there an issue with this? So I myself is aware of some of the transfer certification agency, which also wanted some of us to be on the board with them to do that, and the one had also hesitation because of their uh, hidden agenda. So that would be. One of the things that I thought we would do. Now, with respect to the uh, paper, I, I with, so with respect to the paper, I have some concerns which I thought I would share with him more in terms of uh, drawing his attention to also uh, perhaps uh, you know elaborate to us. So, within the identification of the 15 sectors that, of course, the digital services given in the paper are selected by the uh, Easy Act or by uh, the authors of the paper is something that I'd like to, I'm curious to know. And if this is selected by easy, because there are different issues, if it is selected by the easy act from the government of India, uh, the methodology of selection need to be discussed for such identification. However, if it is selected by the uh, author themselves, then justification and methods need to be correlated with uh, earlier studies, uh, like uh, Satay, who done very interesting work on energy intensity, uh, energy efficiency uh, in India. So the listed industries are not in line with the earlier studies, and that's why uh, the improvement, if any, in selecting these industries would also be uh, mentioned. It's something that uh, I would specifically uh, like to talk about. Secondly, with respect to the methodology. Now, energy efficiency or intensity is a very well debated topic in the area of uh, economics of energy consumption and production, and um, it's been documented quite well in several uh, peer-reviewed journals and other places. So the methodological issues of, is are of great concern in identifying energy intensive and efficient sectors because this is itself is highly debated. Whether it's correct to say some to be efficient in what terms, are you making international comparisons, or do you really have a benchmark with which you're going to make these comparisons, etc. is something that is uh, need to be spelled out very clearly before we carry out the analysis. Now, thirdly, with respect to efficiency, uh, well, the question is, are we talking of efficiency in monitoring or in physical energy use? I think he's talking more about physical energy use, but there's something that needs to be uh, clarified. So if to evaluate the performance of PAN, do the auditors, do the authors depend on the government sources or calculate the benefit from the information collected by VE uh, themselves? That's a question that we have, because now, right, of late CSO, Central Cyber Security Organization, has started collecting this information of energy consumption pattern of every, at the plant level, in their annual survey of industries. 
So that's already there, which is what we started uh, using it for in our own research. So, and of course, in the conclusion of the paper, the authors claim that PAT has achieved 30% targeted uh, energy efficient saving. So, alternatively, if someone compares the uh, LEAP or WDI uh, uh, database on the emission related to energy consumption, emission is increasing in terms of absolute physical units in India, mm -hmm. in general, and for the manufacturing sector in particular. So, then are we not contradicting others? So, energy and emission goals. Uh, goes parallel uh, in um, in uh, is based on technology import and innovation. So, if targeted 30% energy saving is achieved, then why Indian emission parameters are increasing? So, is it because of the lesser energy efficiency uh, used by the firms or sectors, or PAT has achieved economic savings, which is fine. I mean, in, in the production economics framework, for example, of energy consumption rather than physical energy saving, because this is something that we have addressed in a paper and we published this also in terms of economic uh, uh, efficiency achievement in, in terms of energy consumption. And finally, uh, I, I, I thought Dr. Mathur would like to comment also about, although it's not fashionable to talk about CDM today, but uh, is there any link between PAT and CDM in the Indian case? Since CDM was encouraged for quite some time, this could be an interesting question that also need to be addressed. And if we have to take up, take it up, how would he, uh, you know, sort of advise us to uh, take it uh, forward? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah several things to try and put energy efficiency and in, um, in the same arena that we have supply and to try and uh, PAT is one of those initiatives uh, so I think in one sense uh, talking about PAT the biggest achievement of PAT is to get monitoring of specific energy consumption data and uh, at least in my mind that is one big achievement uh, however to look at the disadvantages what if there was no pact let's look at the 478 industries and what would have happened in three years if you do an analysis I've looked at some of those numbers. It, my suggestion is that the savings would have been about the same. And this is a problem uh, going forward. The second problem going forward is that, you know, we sort of tend to believe in the market. And it's good if we can create a market and we have entry and exit. But uh, the experience with renewable energy certificates has shown we have to create a market, we have to create a floor and then all the trading is happening at the floor. So suppose we have a market and then the price of buying an energy yeah, cert is less than the price at which you buy energy. Then a company would rather not save if they had a mandate where they had to get a specific energy consumption. So those are kind of uh, some details but I think in my mind, this is a very interesting uh, initiative in the fact that it has got all companies to think in terms of specific energy consumption and they are putting that norm. Whether then it should be monetized or not is an issue, but I think it's extremely important to set these targets right. And my personal feeling is that 4.2% that which is there in the paper talking of three years, which means about 1.4% per year minus 1.4%. And going forward in the, I just, when I was listening to Dr. Mathur, I just did the calculation for the 670, 621, that also comes to about the same, it's about the same percentage. So I think uh, we need to think in terms of those incentives. We need to see what is the capacity, we have to build the capacity to monitor and document and put some of this data which is again a very interesting thing which has happened. Because of PAT, a lot of this data is now in the public domain and if you want you can do the analysis yourself which was not there earlier. So this is a big, big, big success point. 
Uh, I wouldn't say the success point in the first part is energy saving per se, because a lot of things with energy you must understand that in any way it is useful from a business point of view. So if you are doing the savings, so the question is at what price and will it actually distort the overall market? But having said that, uh, as I said, simple questions for you. Now over to Ajay. This is what I had both credit and I was looking forward. Uh, let me take these up one by one. The transparency in certification is clearly something that I think needs to be addressed in far greater detail than being capable. We have kind of assumed that it will happen. I don't think it happens automatically. This comes up to the question that uh, Ramil, you had also raised about the fact that when you have trading, the trading occurs near the <coughs> bottom. Um, by itself, it will, it will not bother me because clearly energy The reason why people take energy efficiency interventions is because they are less than the cost of energy. So obviously, inserts will trade at less than the cost of energy because the intervention costs less. However, working at the floor is a problem. That What that means is that if the price was lower than the floor, there would have been more trading there. That's a problematic pro uh, issue. And I think the nature of the certification and the nature of the trading therefore become two sides of the same coin. Uh, I don't have an answer to this, but it's clearly something that I think I will need to think about, both I and Ashok Kumar. Ashok is the person in the Bureau who manages the PAC program. We have to think about it a lot more carefully. Uh, you asked the question about the identification of the sectors. Those 15 sectors are there in the Energy Conservation Act. They came as a given. How they came, I'm not very sure. Well, there's some of those aren't. Some of those aren't. The ones that are the highest are certainly there. But chloralkali? No. When, the, when this was written, that was the time when chloralkali was still working on the electrolytic cell process. When its energy consumption was three to four times what it is now. So maybe those are the reasons why uh, they were there. But the Act does specifically provide that the Bureau can change this list. There's a specific provision, so it can be done. Uh, what has been done separately is through various agencies get an idea of what is the energy consumption in different sectors, and therefore if we need to add any more. But Today we have covered eight and now three more, so eleven. So there are still in this list of between some sectors which are not yet part of PAC. One of the things I did not mention is that there is a proposal that new sectors would be added, for example, next year. You don't have to wait for three years and for this cycle to finish before then new sectors are added. Those sectors would have their own three year cycle. So it becomes, so there are some certificates which are coming into the market every year rather than in three year chunks. Uh, on the international comparisons, I agree, we should point it out, uh, make it much more specific uh, and provide uh, that data. Uh, I haven't done it uh, in this presentation, the data do exist, but I think we have to put them together uh, to put it uh, so that there is a clear distinction. Um, the issue of monetary or physical use, well, clearly it was physical that we started with, with the specific energy consumption. But remember that the reason why people invest in energy efficiency is largely as a bottom line uh, 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 intervention. The reason they're doing it is to reduce costs. So it is at the end of the day a monetary benefit. Uh, even though you provide a physical uh, target. Uh, the relationship between how individual industries 
respond to physical targets in terms of getting monetary benefits from themselves is something that was not been studied. I have no idea whether the data that we have would help a better study of this or not. But clearly the way different kinds of industries have responded is very different. So there is a variation in the behavior. The reasons for the variations I think need to be studied. Um, the issue of why are emissions rising? They are rising because of two things. One is that these very industries, remember what is the goal here? The goal is that the specific energy consumption is reduced, not their total. They may be producing there are also new industries that have come in. We are a growing economy. They are also producing something. So we do expect the overall emissions to grow. However, having said that, there is a problem today. Energy use in industry has not grown. Is it because of a market which is depressed? Is it because of PAC? Is it because of both? I don't know. But the fact remains that despite uh, over this three year period, you know, there were negative and positive, there was a five and a half percent growth in the eight sectors that are covered uh, in the back scheme. In these, overall, the energy consumption hasn't grown, uh, which has become a matter of huge concern for the electricity industry because they've greatly expanded. <coughs> Capacity, generation capacity, and there are no buyers. It could also be because business has come up. Uh, in the electricity sector, clearly uh, plants have been set up and are not producing as much as they were supposed to. So, clearly, as I said, I'm not very sure whether it is because of lower business or because of that or because of both. Uh, linkages between CDM and PAT. Very interesting. When we started this program, this was the single largest question that was asked in all the consultations. Every consultation had at least three or four people asking about this thing. By the time this ended, it was a non-issue. CDN was dead. <laughs> but we did take a stand. And the stand was that CDM is a different mechanism, it's an international mechanism, it is about reducing CO2 emissions. Now, what do you do to reduce CO2 emissions may also reduce your specific energy consumption. We don't care about it. So you can earn CDM benefits and you can earn specific energy consumption reduction and therefore e service from the same intervention. Remember, CDM was at the level of a project within the industry. This is at the level of the industry overall. But we <coughs> consciously decided that these two could be independent of each other. In the end, it didn't matter. Uh, for what it is worth, we, that's the call we made. Uh, Raman, I think it's a very important point that you made that the data are now in the public domain and the fact that industry is monitoring specific I mean, I must confess this is something which I kind of peripherally knew but hadn't brought to the center of my uh, thinking. I would strongly urge, look at the two notifications, the two target notifications of 31st March 2012 and 31st March 2016. At least from 400, uh, uh, the 470, uh, or 400, no. It's a 420 support. Industries, you have data for the baseline years of 11 12. You have the baseline data, you have the target data for 15 16, and you have the targets for 18 19. I think this is a great lesson. See what you can get. It's not yet available in an electronic form, so people will have to actually sit down and type these things in, but at least it's out there. Uh, Raghun, one of the things that I would like to throw up for discussion is whether the savings would have been the same 
with how it packed. Because what we were seeing was a 1.4 percent reduction before PAC came into uh, existence. That was the average savings. Now, that was the average savings for these, uh, uh, for the non-electricity sectors. For the electricity sectors, the savings were, was more like 1 percent a year. So when you combine the two, you come to about 1.2 percent. What we have actually achieved here is something of the order of 2 percent. Um, maybe if there was no pact, there was just enough talk that there was a requirement that this data is provided, maybe it could have happened even then. It's just bringing the data from the boiler room to the board room which made the difference. It's quite possible. But I, again, I think some degree of analysis is needed as to how we could have got this data from the boiler room to the board room to get the kind of attention it deserved that the average rate of uh, 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 savings in the non-electricity sector went up and in the electricity sector also uh, went up. Uh, Clearly, the markets, the, the, the policy driven markets, whether it is for REC or ESAs, are not working. This is again something that I think we will need to think about. We, we have poor cut twice. Is this a, again, I think this is an area which I certainly will work on, and I hope we get a lot of work on how we can, what is needed to get the kinds of uh, 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 alignment between different actors so that this happens. Do we need to change the set of actors to make this align? Those kinds of issues, I think, are needed for this policy uh, to move ahead. Uh, I hope that I've answered, answered or you know, even if the answer was I don't know, I hope I've addressed the questions that the two discussants have put, but we would be very, very happy to also continue this discussion with any and all. I, I think this is the time to open up this uh, for a question and answer session. I think we have volunteers who will take the mic. So we have the first yeah. question going up here and the second there. Yeah, and three. So, and also, yeah, we we'll take three questions and then. And you can also identify who they are. Tell me Would it help 
if there were if there was a mandate for them to have such department to just look at energy conservation measures in the you know did they do that or if they have it would be helpful yeah Maybe I take a peripheral view of fairness. The question to you is: Is it fair to force the industry to improve efficiency while the economy as a whole is irresponsible? For instance, why do we give loans to buy cars instead of giving those loans to people to invest in capital efficiency of energy? And then second question is regarding the plant load factor. What is the lesson we have learned from that? And is there any corrective action in play? Targets. Please identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Myself, Hanikhet, I'm doing that. Means I'm a PhD scholar here in Sitar department. Uh, as we mentioned, that there is a problem of bandwidth, and uh, we are setting that some targets uh, for reduction of specific energy consumption. So, uh, anyhow, some industries or some uh, uh, sectors are performing very badly. So, why not to set the low targets for them? to motivate so means it it can be uh, means i think that it can be uh, simple for implementation and achieve some good things and second uh, while uh, targets are uh, set to uh, for the different sectors as you have mentioned uh, that uh, their number of dcs evaluated in the textile industries are very large but the energy saving is very low so can't we set the targets different for textile industries only than cement industry or than the other performing industries? Because uh, means we cannot compare the big textile industry with the big cement industry because some problems might be different for different sectors. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, cement industry. You know, the cement industry, as you very rightly note, was the first sector in this country to consciously start addressing the issue of energy costs. And I think the reason they did it, and this is again anecdotal, is because cement is very easily traded. 91, when the economy opened up, cement imports in this country started. And they started threatening local production. So, for example, the person who heads energy efficiency at ACC believes that that is what led to the cement industry taking such a proactive role. Uh, but again, I'm an outsider. Uh, as, I, as I said, this is an you also ask the question if the developed countries went through the bandwidth problem, and the quick answer is I don't know. What I can do is ask, for example, people in the US Department of Energy if they have data. The problem now is something different. The Indian cement sector is the most energy efficient cement sector amongst any country of the world, Japan included. Our most inefficient plant is more efficient than the most efficient US plant. Right? So you look at the difference. It's huge. Earlier it used to be that the average Indian plant was better than the average US plant. Now the worst Indian plant is better than the best US plant. Uh, however, today all of the US plants are within a hundred kilocalories of each other. They're all wet plants, they haven't even become dry plants. Which is the reason why our least efficient plant is more efficient than their most efficient plant. Uh, 
what has also happened now is that I think with no exception, every cement plant is an energy manager. That's happened. Uh, what has also happened is that this sector, more than any other sector of the economy, now has waste heat recovery plants. Many of them are co generation, but there is waste heat recovery. Most of these, anyway, uh, let's not go into, I was going into the quality of the waste heat generation plant, the reliability, and so on. Let's not get into that. But the point is they've done it. What it told us is that this is a sector which is behaving very differently from some other sectors. So what we also started doing was getting this sector together with other sectors, have joint meetings to see what can be learned, passed on from one sector to another. So the Institute of Industrial Productivity helps these, uh, there's something, some sharing, lesson sharing or something, something they call it. And we just structure it and uh, this is something that has started happening. Professor Joe, you asked about the fairness question. Let me first give you the bureaucrat's answer. The bureaucrat's answer is, my job was to, the Energy Conservation Act says, do this. I did that. It asked me to put labels on appliances. I did that. It asked me to make an energy conservation building code for buildings. I did that. Okay. So that's the narrow answer. Uh, but it's, it's, I say it in jest, but there is an element of truth that I really can't step outside what has been given to But the larger question that you asked was put to, by industry to us. When we started this program, industry was just coming out of the 2000. 9, 10, 11 depression. And the question they asked was that when the entire economy is in a depression, you are putting this extra burden on us. So this was a question that was asked. And the answer to it was that please look at what is happening globally. With the kinds of incentives that occurred in other countries to help uh, industries recover from the economic downturn means that if you don't do this, you will be worse off than them. So for competitive reasons, it's important that in times, particularly in times of downturn, you have a protection. This is what I'm going to see. So as far as an economic argument goes, it's an amazingly powerful argument to say that you have to protect yourself against the downturn. Uh, what have we learned from PLF? Okay. This is a subject on which I can speak for about four or five hours. After the Of course, of course. See, Girish, of course, uh, came. Girish was also he was also looking after energy efficiency at one point. But now, in the CRC, is much more looking after the supply side. One of the huge changes that is happening in the economy is that more and more buildings, for example this one, are air conditioned. On this campus, there was no air conditioned building when you were a student. Note the difference. Right. So one is obviously the amount of energy increases. That's one point. But the second point is, there is a huge amount of energy that is needed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And there is much less energy that is needed at 10 p.m. at night. So what we are seeing is to meet that maximum demand, you need more power stations. But they work for a shorter period of time because at 10 o'clock, many of them have to shut down. This is one of the main reasons why the, why the, why the, uh, 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 maximum demand and minimum demand curves are not in parallel but are the difference is occurring. This to me has got a huge amount of clarity. One of course air conditioners have to become amazingly more. But the second also is that we need to bring in demand response measures. Every air conditioner should have a chip. So when the demand becomes too high 
either somebody on campus or somebody in whoever your supplier is VSES says I am setting all of them to 26 degrees centigrade and therefore you miss out that large peak and you can have low the difference between the maximum and the minimum can be uh, the issue of bandwidth and whether all sectors should have the same targets. Already we have moved away from that. If the cement sector is the most efficient sector in the world, can they actually meet a 4% target next time around? Clearly they no. Therefore, PAC 2 now has a different set of rules. Places where there is, you know, in this period also what happened was many of these people got very deep. We got very detailed energy audits done to find out what, what is the kind of opportunities that occur. And therefore, the targets for each sector are now different. I don't know enough about this to be able to say exactly what changes are there, but the one that I do know is the plants which are amongst the most efficient in the world now have, some of them have even zero targets, which wasn't there earlier. And those where the opportunities are very large do have larger targets. So while the average, as you very rightly pointed out, is still similar to the uh, earlier target, its distribution is now not the same, you know, the five, you said five percent, one size fits all. That's no longer the case. Uh, just take a couple of questions and then the rest of the discussion can happen offline. Uh, my name is from uh, My questions are rather naive. Uh, I think now that the panel is here, I can take the liberty to ask these questions. So I'm wondering the scale of operation has to do with uh, this. Uh, does it really play any role in SEC or yeah. not? That is one. Second is that 51 industries have dropped out. If you look at the whole pie, just by removing that, what is the what is the implication of that? And third one is when we comparing when whenever we are saying the US versus India, are we also uh, looking at CPCP norms, environmental concerns that US has vis-a-vis -vis India, or is it just specific energy consumption we are uh, looking at? Thank you. Good evening, sir. I am a first year NTEC student. Uh, as I understand, PAT is for energy intensive large industries. Uh, since big players are involved in this market, uh, to maintain the goodwill and to meet standards, they are quite efficient. But if you look at other sectors uh, which uh, individual, individually consume lesser energy, but their quantum is very big, say MSP, uh, micro and small scale industries, medium scale industries, and others like agriculture where you need to lift water and all that. So th what are the policies in place for these sectors? And if you are really, uh, really looking for uh, Incre increment in energy efficiency, what role these industries can play or what, what role these sectors can play? Yeah, Surya from Energy Science and Engineering. Um, is, is government is having any plans to set minimum value or like a bond for this certificate? That's one. And second thing is you told that there was an amendment that was made uh, which prohibit uh, others to participate in the bidding process. Why is that? is your specific energy consumption. So if you are small 
and your specific energy consumption is high, that is your baseline. Now, whatever you have to achieve, whatever target you have to achieve is from that baseline. So, I am not expecting you to come to the level of the large industry who has a lower SEC. I, I know that you are there and you have to, have to operate, you have to become less prone there. So that is why the uh, industry specific uh, targets were uh, provided. What was the impact of these 51 who dropped out? Uh, the total impact of all of them combined was 3.2% of the total energy consumption. So very clearly they were smaller companies, largest number of them were in the textile sector, a couple of the bulk and paper sector, one in the fertilizer, not fertilizer, one in the, uh, a couple in the small giant sector, not in the uh, integrated steel sector. Uh, the issue of pollution norms. Again, as I did with Professor Jog, I'm going to take the answer of a bureaucrat. My mandate was for specific energy consumption. Because somebody else's concern as far as <coughs> what we did was, we said you have to meet all other regulatory mechanisms that have been put into place. And you will file papers saying that you have met those norms. Now, having said that, all we did was, we didn't want to step on anybody else's toes. I, I'm not the regulator of the pollution side, but what I wanted to make sure was if I could increase the number of people who were meeting the pollution control norms for that person. What we also said, because we knew that this was in the offing, we also said that if there are new pollution control norms and they have an implication on energy efficiency, they will be taken into account in the normalization. So in the, in the uh, power stations, now you've got new norms which are amazingly tough. And every new power plant which comes from the 1st of January next year, and even the older plants, these new norms now apply. So clearly, there will be an energy penalty which will reflect in the specific energy. You talked of the other sectors, SME, agriculture, etc. Um, let me give you my two pennies worth as far as SME is concerned. Um, like the large companies, one of the things we found was it's not that the SMEs don't know about energy efficiency opportunities. One of the things we found across the board was information is not really a problem. People know this. Then what is the problem? The problem with SMEs largely is that there is one entrepreneur who is the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, the chief marketing officer, the chief uh, uh, operating officer. You know, he does everything. His time is limited. So unless he can get Number one, a uh, very well documented and almost packaged product, he is not going to spend time on this. Because for the SMEs, the, by far, not small, but by far the largest return comes from increasing production rather than from energy efficiency enhancement. Energy efficiency enhancements bring in 15 to 20 percent. We thought it's great. But if the fellow increases production, the, the increases are like 50 percent. No, no, nothing. So it's not that he will not do it, but then he wants a package products. I don't need to worry about it. I only need to sign the check. He then also needs to make sure that this will work. So either somebody takes responsibility or this is so well known, 20 people in the same cluster have done it that he will do it. So the challenge there is to create models in which packages can be made available and that 
there is somebody who takes responsibility. So these kinds of business models are now being tested. So for example, in the boundary sector in Coimbatore, there, it, it turned out by a rather interesting coincidence, I don't need by this team. Amazingly difficult, uh, you know, if you have a talent which is based on horsepower, then if I buy a five horsepower pump, I'll ask the fellow to put a three horsepower thing on it. Now when I go to change the pump, I'll say, the three horsepower car, I'll put a three horsepower pump. He'll say, no, I said, oh, five car now. How on earth can you justify it? The second thing that happens with efficient pumps is that they pump out more water. So you can actually go for a lower pump. But he goes, no, I always put a five horsepower pump here. My father put a five horsepower pump here. So what happens is that for each pump installation, you have to do what we call a bucket test. In so many seconds is this much water coming, this bucket gets filled. You can imagine the transaction costs, pump to pump to pump. So again, we are looking at a very different model there. Uh, we are hoping that EESL, Energy Efficiency Services Limited, will come into this space. Bring down costs by bulk procurement. And on the other hand, work with a range of service providers who do this kind of work at the level of parts. So we have minimum value of a certificate. Uh, we have thought a lot about it. And many of us were completely agnostic whether it should be there or it should be there. If it was there, it provides a signal of what the price should be. But if Supposing, as in the case of REC, there's no trading. Because people want to trade below the floor price. Then you're artificially curtailing trading. You're not going to prices below the So who, who are we that we have a superior knowledge of what the market price should be, what the clearing price should be? There are both sides of the argument, I think, in the BE, there has been a decision that there would be no floor price. But again, this is a decision that was taken after I left, so I'm not very sure, but I think the decision has been taken. Last thing you said about <coughs> participation, the quick answer was that if other people participate, if I don't need the certificate, then what will I do with it? I will keep it and wait for the price to increase and then sell it. In other words, I become a speculator. Once I become a speculator, then under the Indian law, this is covered by the Agricultural Forward Markets Commission. They are the regulator. We did not want the Agricultural Forward Markets Commission to become the regulator for that. We wanted the CERC to remain the regulator. So we consciously opted that the market would be limited to the designated regions. Thank you. Bring this to uh, close up the session, but I think we have some small pleasant duty to perform. Uh, Ganesh will tell about it. I request Mr. Rangan to uh, present the token of appreciation. Oh, wonderful! So that brings.